Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's edition of MetalCon Live. Today's session is titled Whole Building Air Leakage Testing is Coming. Do not fear it. Being presented today by Adam Ugluza of the Sustainable Building Partners and a member of the Air Barrier Association of America. The Air Barrier Association of America is our co-presenter of today's session. They're a national nonprofit trade association consisting of a wide cross-section of stakeholders all within the enclosure industry. For more information, please visit their website at airbarrier.org. A big thank you to the ABAA for co-presenting today's session. Mark your calendars for a few weeks from today to join us for the NFBA 285 and other fire considerations webinar. That webinar is being presented by RAINA, the Rain Screen Industry Association in North America. And as you all know, if you've been with us for any time now, registration is now open for MetalCon and we do look forward to welcoming, welcoming all of you to that show in October. Take a special note because ABBA is presenting two sessions at MetalCon this year. Those courses are titled Performance Requirements for High Performance Buildings and Installation Requirements for Air and Water Resistive Barriers in Buildings. Finally, a few quick housekeeping notes to be aware of. Be sure to fill out the form at the end of this webinar to receive your certificate of attendance and your AIA credit if applicable. If you run into any issues with that, you can email me at kaylin at metalcon.com and I'll be happy to help you from there. If you run into any technical issues today, please reach out to MetalCon Live in the chat and I'll be able to help you. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Adam now. Adam, take it away. Hi, Adam. We can't hear you quite yet. Whenever you're ready, take yourself off of mute. <laughs> can you? All right. Can you see the screen and everything? Sorry about that. I Absolutely, we can. All right. <laughs> Amateur here. All right. Wow. Uh, let's get started then. So, yeah. So, whole building, I know the title is Whole Building Air Leakage, but um, we often call it Whole Building Air Tightness Testing as well in the industry. So, it's basically one and the same, but um, we'll be covering the test and, and you know, what to look for, why not to be afraid of it, and uh, in a lot of ways, embrace it because it actually identifies um, and creates a process <clears throat> in construction that eliminates deficiencies and issues that might um, cause catastrophic failures or just performance issues in the building you can catch them early with this type of test. So. Um, <clears throat> Just a quick background on me. I'm a building enclosure consultant, I, but uh, I've also had the opportunity to become an expert in whole building air tightness testing. I've tested um, hundreds of buildings of all different sizes from you know, residential size homes to <clears throat> skyscrapers. Um, so it, it can be done on any size building. It, uh, it just requires a different amount of building prep and, and coordination beforehand, but essentially the concept's the same. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that today um, through the process of how to run a test, how to prepare for a test, what to look for um, if you're part of the construction team or manufacturer <clears throat> that hasn't done this test before and wants to kind of know some tricks or what to look for for this test and how to pass it. Um, hopefully I can answer some of those questions and and uh, if not, you know, after if you have any other questions, I'm happy to to hop on a call or or answer them in any way I can. But uh, as far as the my, I'm a board of director for the ABAA. Um, I'm also a co chair for the whole building air tightness task group. So we're actually, and I'll talk about it at the end of the presentation. We developed a training program for whole building air tightness testing to help get the industry. Um, testing agencies up to speed so that this when this does roll out there'll be enough um, qualified testing or testers out there that can perform testing on larger buildings um, there's also a certification program that that we're going to um, uh, roll out here very soon as well so uh, the goal would be that 
And if you are having a test done on your project that you have somebody that's gone through a training program like the ABA is offering and has the certification <clears throat> that shows that they understand the, the, the process and uh, <clears throat> all the all the important uh, steps that you have to follow and to know how to run the test correctly. So today <clears throat> we'll summarize the, they'll quickly summarize the benefits of whole building air testing. I know the the intro abstract kind of touches on it. Uh, and then we'll talk about the industry standards. 3158 was also referenced in the abstract, but there's a history there. There's there's other test standards that are out there that you might see. They're also, you know, they're currently included in old older code um, uh, years. So <clears throat> I'll explain, you know, the genesis of where they where it started and, and sort of where 3158 <clears throat> is and, and what it came from. So we'll go through the whole building air test procedure. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the things, uh, you know, how we investigate if a building's not passing initially when you're firing up the fans, you know, it's don't panic. Um, a lot of the time there's building prep issues or there's low hanging fruit that you can uh, address and, and have a successful test. Now, that's not to say don't address all the issues that you might find during the test. I mean, you should really resolve all of them. But as far as passing the test, um, generally, there's there's uh, depending on what performance criteria you're shooting for, if it's just code level, um, there's usually pretty easy things that you can do to, to get to a successful test. Uh, and then lastly, I'll describe the ABA, that the whole building air tightness uh, uh, training program and then also the certification and then some of the upcoming uh, training dates that if you want to sign up for the training um, that's being offered. Uh, we have one location now, but they're going to be hopefully as a, the uh, program grows in, in uh, uh, popularity, we're hoping to, uh, we've got two other locations on the East Coast that we're hoping to open up soon. So so why is air tightness performance or important? Uh, energy savings is, is an obvious one. Uh, what we're finding now, it's kind of like the last, we've done all the other things, you know, we've changed the light bulbs out. We've really uh, made the mechanical systems more efficient and we've kind of delayed maybe the enclosure. I'm, I'm biased obviously because I'm an enclosure consultant. I thought that, I think the enclosure is very, very important. Should have been something that we addressed from the beginning, but we're here now and uh, now there's a lot of focus on it. So I think because it's been sort of a delay, uh, we haven't really honed in on the importance of air tightness in terms of energy savings. And I'll get in a little bit more of why, why we sort of missed the mark on that uh, and really understanding the impact. We've always known in the building science world, building enclosure world that it had a huge impact, but the industry as a whole uh, really hasn't um, put the weight that it really needs. So some modeling uh, techniques have been developed and uh, and I'll get in that into a little bit that's that's really showing how much impact it has. And as we're pushing to get to net zero or closer to net zero, you really find that the enclosure plays a huge role in it in that and, and, and achieving those performance targets. Um, and if you don't have it, if it doesn't perform, particularly air tightness levels aren't there, um, you're not going to get to it. So it's it's extremely important, and uh, you know verifying it in the field is the only way to really know how how well you're doing. You can you can draw it on paper, but um, you really got to get the parts and pieces together to create you know a continuous boundary around the entire building. So that's hard to do, or can or can be hard to do. Uh, what else can it help with? Moisture control. There's a tremendous amount of moisture transported uh, through three-dimensional airflow. So any hole that you have in the building, um, the best way to, to visualize it is in the summertime, particularly when you have that hot human air wanting to come in. Um, just a tremendous amount of water that comes through just three-dimensional airflow. And then when it gets into the building or gets into a surface that's below dew point, it'll deposit that moisture. So if you have a very leaky building, you're it seems crazy to think about it, but you're transporting gallons of water um, just through three-dimensional airflow. Um, so by having a more airtight uh, enclosure, you're going to limit that moisture exposure. It's going to help with the durability of the building. It's going to help with the efficiencies of the mechanical systems. 
We also find that when we're when we're really designing for a, a hype, uh, an airtight enclosure, the, the mechanical engineers become more comfortable with their sizing uh, and of the units that they use to condition the building. So the more we put push for air tightness, the more efficient sized mechanical systems, smaller uh, mechanical systems. So that dives into the cost. You know, if we can use a quarter of the the the, the power <laughs> to to condition the building, um, obviously that's that's a cost savings for the owner up front. Occupant comfort, you know, we're we're more uh, definitely more particular about our inside uh, space now. Um, you know, even a, a couple de degree difference uh, from one person to another can mean a lot. So having the ability to, to adjust that on that level, uh, you really need a, an enclosure that's performing one, uh, performing very well, particularly one that's airtight. Um, um, air quality, obviously, that's a big one that's that's come up lately. Um, we want to be able to we want to know where the holes are in the building. We want to be able to control that air, exhaust it, put it through our filtration systems. We don't want it to just randomly come in and out of the building um, uh, and not be able to effectively condition it and and even take out viruses, take out whatever contaminants are in the air, and then recycle it. If we're gonna if we're gonna use the air again, we can still uh, filter it in a way that it it increases the air quality of the building and then building durability, as I mentioned before. So we want to make sure our buildings are lasting longer uh, and. You know, as far as sustainability goes, you know, we really don't want to build a building in 30 years. We'd like to last for 100 years. I mean, that should be our goal. So, as I mentioned, in, as an industry, we really haven't been hitting the mark on on carrying the amount of weight that air tightness or air leakage um, really has. So, recently, the ABA funded a project through NIST and um, used some. Uh, very sophisticated three-dimensional airflow software uh, to develop some uh, some coefficients that we can use with Energy Plus um, to really show how much energy is actually being used or, or wasted uh, because of uh, a building that's that's really not performing at the levels that we'd like to see for air tightness. And what we found is, or what the study found is that the traditional methods of, of you know running through your energy model in the beginning, um, and then using these these new coefficients that were developed through the study, you could see it uh, you know forty three percent difference in the impact. You know we were off that much. So if you think about every energy model that's being done, it's not really capturing the impact of air leakage. Um, so that has a lot of in, uh, has a lot of uh, uh, issues aside a, a part of it one is you don't it you don't think it's that important so we're then we don't focus on it um and that carries a whole nother thing with it you know if we're not focusing on air tightness then maybe we're not focusing on water control you know a building that's more airtight generally is going to be more watertight uh, just because you're looking at the details you're developing those details so that they're providing a continuous barrier between interior and exterior environment so it has a lot of repercussions that we haven't been Put, putting a lot of weight on it, not just energy. So now that we have this tool, you know, we're hoping like, hoping that um, it can start being implemented across the country, and we'll start seeing a, a little bit more focus on the air leakage component of a building, and and really honing in on those enclosure details to make sure that we're getting the air tightness levels that we're that we're really striving for. Um, when I talk about whole building, it's the it's basically the balloon that you know that. that that is the whole building. So it's it's that outer surface area that that is separating exterior from interior environments. Um, we re, we literally are pressurizing the entire building at one time. Um, doesn't matter the size, the concept's the same. We're trying to create the same pressure difference across all six sides of the box of the building. So exterior walls, roofing, uh, your slab on grade, or you might have a an, uh, a podium condition where you've got a slab over parking level, that would be considered part of that enclosure. So really just testing that that air bear, air boundary um, where we're conditioning and where we're not conditioning. We want to make sure that that condition space, we're not losing that that energy that we're 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 using to cool or heat the building. Uh, this is one that I I think is uh, very important to remember. We we 
tend to get stuck in a rut sometimes on, on new construction projects where, you know, design teams and construction teams are so concerned about vapor diffusion uh, and they forget about the bigger fish that's going to eat you, which is the, the air control and water control, um, air control in particular. Uh, you could sit and, and debate over what permeability level of a membrane you're going to use in a wall, but then forget about the interface right next to it that's letting thousands of CFM or hundreds of CFM passed and in the building that's carrying a thousand times greater the amount of moisture than vapor diffusion. So I always throw this slide in there. Uh, you know, don't get stuck on the stuff that, that really doesn't have the big impact. Focus on, focus on the bigger stuff, which is all the interfaces between windows and walls, the, the, the wall to roof interface. Those are the places you're going to get, you know, if you, if you have uncontrolled air leakage, you're going to have such a, a greater amount of water being transported into your building and, and causing issues. So um, don't get don't get caught in the light bulb and get grabbed by the fish. Um, now we'll dive into the industry standard. So as I mentioned, thirty one fifty eight. That's the new. That's the the latest and greatest, and that really was developed through two older standards, which was uh, ASTM E seven seven nine and ASTM eighteen twenty seven. That's what I began using uh, when I when I started. Um, ASTM E779 is a multi-point regression method, and I'll show an example of what that is. 1827, similar, but it just it's got the single point method and the two point method. So it's just how you're <clears throat> pressurizing the building, how many uh, data points you're taking, and how you analyze the data. Um, so what we did with 3158, <clears throat> basically combine those. So you have the multi-point, the single point, the two-point methods all in one standard. And then we also provided more guidance <clears throat> as to how to actually perform the test. There was 779, 18, were limited in, in, in direction. Um, and because of that, there were some issues with repeatability and accuracy of the testing. 3158, the goal was to correct those issues <clears throat> so that we could get more, you know, repeatable tests and more accurate testing um, as we, you know, un, uh, roll this out across the country and we're testing millions of buildings. Um, the the most, the, in terms of commercial buildings or large building air tightness testing, multi-point regression method is, is the one that's always used. Uh, it's very rare that you would have a single point or two point method. So uh, what we see today or what I explained today is it, the testing that's been done or on the buildings that I'm showing you is, is all multi-point uh, regression method. And what that means is essentially you have a, typically 10 data points. So you're, you're pressurizing the building to say 40 pascals, and then you're moving up in equal increments till you hit 75 pascals um, or greater. Um, 75 pascals is the is the pressure that uh, commercial buildings are tested to. Um, so we take that data. It's a log log graph, creates this linear um, uh, plane that if those data points come off that plane, there's statistical analysis that that's done through that standard that uh, basically if the correlation's off, it's indicating that there's something wrong with the test. Something's changing. So, you know, you have to go check the building prep. You got to check, is there a door flying open? So it's very accurate at, at detecting something wrong with the test specimen of the building so that you can correct it. And then also, if you have very uh, inclement weather and you're trying to test high wind uh, situations, uh, it basically, you know, there's certain cases where the wind's so high that you can't do it. So it's 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 really there to make sure that the the test is accurate and then it can be repeated. You, the goal is that you do you could one testing agency could test the building and then a month later do the exact same test and you would get the similar result. So multi-point regression analysis is, is has been found to be the most accurate in that sense. Is there a question? Yes, we do have a question. This is coming from Chang Hong Sun. When designing building envelopes, how how do you balance air tightness and natural ventilation, or is there no conflict when it comes to those two? Uh, I guess it depends on how you're naturally ventilating. If you're naturally ventilating through 
random holes, I would not recommend doing that. Meaning you're just letting it up to the contractor to not create continuity with the air barrier or an interface. You don't really know how well you're inter you're you're ventilating in that case. Um, if natural ventilating is through operable windows or relief dampers or something along those lines, then it's then I could see I I still would would prefer not to do that. I think you'd still be losing energy. Uh, you'd you'd be uh, addressing the ventilation requirement, but there's other ways to ventilate and with energy recovery systems or heat recovery systems that allow you to get that air exchange, but it's all under a controlled uh, uh, method that uh, is more energy efficient, but achieves the same thing. So I guess it, I guess it depends on what what's meant by natural ventilation. Um, I think the goal is to strive for an airtight enclosure and then ventilate through your mechanical systems. Um, if you have operables, you can do that, but then it's a function of, you know, how people are actually, are they leaving the windows open when they're not supposed to? So it's the human variable can sometimes make things complex. <laughs> Understood completely. They also had a secondary question, which is when it comes to the multi-point regression testing, do you use the same process for healthcare buildings or rooms? And do you use the same process for interior wall and exterior wall usage? Uh, as, far, as far as building type, you would use it for for any building type. So the process is the same. Uh, if you're testing a smaller space, a, a room, um, a single point test could work in that scenario. The reason is the, the limitation of a single point test with whole building is because you've got such a a large specimen. You can't, you don't have eyes on 100% of that surface area for the test. So if something happens, like a door opens, if you're just with a single point test, essentially you would, in, in a 75 Pascal test um, condition, essentially you would be bringing the test specimen up to 75 Pascals and you do that five times. Um, the issue that happens is when you're bringing it up to that full test pressure, there's lots of things that open up. Uh, like if a door wasn't set to latch properly, it could fly open and you would get the repeated results. You get the same CFM leakage because that door would fly open the same way every time you did that at that test pressure. The multi-point regression allows you to see as you go up the test pressure, some, if something changes like a door opens, um, you're going to see that data. It's going to be a step in the data points. So you're going to say, ah, something's not right. I've got to stop the test. I got to check my test boundary because something's not right. Um, but when you have a small test specimen, like a room, um, a single point method can be effective because you have visibility to that entire uh, test specimen. Perfect. That's all the questions we have so far. Okay. Yeah. So that was, I mean, as far as the, um, I don't have a slide specific for single point and two point, but essentially instead of having equally spaced uh, uh, test pressures um, increasing or decreasing in pressure with a single point test, you would just pick whatever your test pressure was. So if your leakage rate at 75 Pascals was the test, so say uh, code 0.4 at 75, 0.4 CFM per square foot at 75 Pascals, you'd bring your test specimen up to 75 Pascals and measure CFM and you repeat that uh, five times um, and then basically analyze the data. With a two-point test, you'd pick a low point and a, basically a, a lower test pressure and a higher test pressure, and you do a similar thing where you would uh, take those, those test pressures multiple times, and then you'd analyze the data um, using the calculations in the test standard. Uh, like I said, in commercial buildings, uh, multi-point is really what's being used. Um, Two point, there could be an argument for that, but if you're doing two points, the multi point, you're you're already, you're already on your path to do multi point, and multi point's just a much better. There's more data points, there's more um, accuracy, and and over time, as we've done this test and we've we've seen how the data is produced through high wind conditions, um, different building types uh, that may respond to wind differently than others. 
the more data you have, the more data points you have, the accurate, more accurate the test. And that's that's really why multi-point regression is, has really been what's been adopted as being the, the test that needs to be done. Uh, other industry standards. So the Army Corps of Engineers. So this is in between when we had seven, ASTM E779. Uh, there was kind of a, a, a this this area where we needed more direction with a, with E779. We also needed a way to detect where the air leakage paths were. So what the Army Corps of Engineers did, they they decided that they felt it was it was important that they tested all their new buildings. Um, and analyzed the 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 energy uh, benefits, and they found obviously that it was very beneficial. So, right now, all um, Army Corps, NAVFAC, uh, GSA buildings, they're all tested. Uh, they all have whole building air tightness testing done. the The Army Corps protocol. That's a document you can if you just Google it, or you can get it off the ABA website. It's a protocol that that really dives in. It enhances, it has enhancements to E779. A lot of those enhancements were adopted in 3158. What it also includes is, is procedures on how to perform the diagnostic portion of testing where you're finding where the air leakage sites are, either that's through infrared scanning or there's smoke tracers that you can use to identify those leakage paths. Um, it's a great document um, and it was, it, it's still, very useful to have um, in terms of the diagnostic procedures. Um, and uh, I'm anticipating that we probably will be updating that to incorporate ASTM E3158 in the near future. Uh, the other diagnostic methods now, this might not always, it's not gonna necessarily come along with the code, but if you ever are part of a test, you should, you should uh, definitely have, make sure the testing agency is also performing the diagnostics. You don't want a building to fail and then they just kind of walk away and you don't know how the heck to fix it. Um, so ASTM 1186 is a great diagnostic air leakage site detection. Uh, there's a number of procedures in there. Um, the two that are most commonly used when you're doing whole building air tightness testing is infrared scanning with pressurization. Same thing with smoke tracers. Basically, you create a pressure difference. Um, and that enhances the, the image when you're doing an infrared scan or with the smoke tracer, it creates uh, air currents that the smoke can pick up and you can figure out kind of where it's coming from, where it's going. So those two, two tools in conjunction uh, are very powerful in helping you determine um, where that air leakage site is in the building. Uh, I, I saw 6781, that's, that's a standard that's often uh, referenced um, you see it on a lot, of, a lot of government projects. It's just a, a general inf, uh, standard method for how to perform infrared scanning. So you don't always see it. I, I, I threw it in here because it is commonly specified along with this test. So it's just a, creates product procedures so that the infrared, uh, whoever is doing the infrared scan is doing it properly and repeatable and, and, and all those things, so. So test preparation. So we'll dive into, you know, how the heck this test is being done. Um, it's actually very, very straightforward, but it just takes a lot of planning and coordination. That's the key to it. You got to make sure you have a team ready. Um, and that team includes everybody on the project, not just the testing agency. If you get everybody involved, it goes very, very smooth. So we'll go through those steps and what's really required to make sure that you're doing it uh, efficiently and effectively um, on the day of the test. So as I mentioned, yeah, planning is everything. 95% um, of the test is, is the coordination, the building prep. 5% is actually running the test. So uh, very, very important to establish the correct planning procedures um, before the test. Make sure that you got the right parties involved and, and uh, definitely have a pre-test meeting. Um, I'll show you an example, but Pre-test plan, you know, have a have a, a testing plan developed that outlines all the procedures, all the people that are important to it, that test, the owner, the, the architect, general contractor, trades, um, and what their roles and responsibilities are the day of the test. Um, organize a conference call meeting, definitely have to do this before the tests. 
run through everybody's responsibilities, make sure they understand who that person is going to be on site that's going to do the, what their specific role is and have contact information for it. Um, and then if you have to have a, uh, uh, you know, if it's a more complicated building or you're a little bit concerned that the building's not ready, have the testing agency come out or have, if you have an enclosure consultant that's familiar with the test, you know, walk the building, make sure that, that you don't have things missing or you're not ready for the test. Make sure that you're good to go before you, you have the testing agency mobilized to come out and do the test. Um, little things like thresholds and weather seals. I mean, they can really impact the test performance. Um, it's not something to overlook. And uh, it just takes a, a quick walk around the building to figure out, you know, what, what those last little things are that you got to get done before the test uh, is ready. So testing agency responsibilities, develop that test plan. Um, as I mentioned, review the enclosure area calculations. That's something that, you know, on Army Corps jobs, that's a sort of a well-oiled machine. Ar architects or designers that are usually part of those projects understand this, but uh, for most commercial projects, you're usually coaching that. So it, it's calculating the surface area of the enclosure. And that needs to come from the designer because they designed the building, obviously. So they should know where that air barrier boundary is. So that six-sided box that I mentioned earlier, that would be, you know, you're taking the, the six-sided surface area, calculating that up, and that's going to determine, you're going to multiply that by the leakage rate for the test. And that's going to tell you the allowable CFM that you um, uh, can have to be able to achieve a pass test. You need to be lower than that. Um, so it's a, it's in a very important calculation, and that's why really the testing agency shouldn't be doing it. It should be, you know, it should be the designer doing that because it does affect a pass fail um, for the test. Uh, submit a, a test, a fan location plan. So in that background in the slide, you can see I've, I've laid out the the floor plan and all where all the equipment's going to go. Now that's important because you need to understand what doors can be shut. Sometimes you have uh, limitations on what doors you can use um, for the test. So giving the general contractor that location of where the doors are going to be. And then once you establish where those doors are, where the, where's the power coming from? Typically, if each fan needs its own uh, separate circuit. So certain doors may not be uh, okay to use because the power source is near there. You know, there's not enough independent circuits to uh, supply those fans with power effectively. So and then the other thing is just uh, you know, mobilizing your equipment, um, having a, 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 a plan in place like this just makes you move more efficiently on site. Everybody knows where you're going to be. Um, you know, you're helping coordinate with the other trades that might be doing some finished work, but it just makes the process go smooth because they know where you're going to be setting up equipment and where you're going to be running your tubing, your cables, so on and so forth. So uh have to submit this band location plan. That's such a critical part of the test plan. Schedule that pre-test meeting. So at that point, you've got the plan, you've got the location plan. Uh, you can go through that with everybody uh, that's that's important to the test. Everybody should walk away from that meeting having a really good understanding of what's going to happen. Uh, reviewing the building preparation part. So that's typically something that the general contractor is going to perform. Uh, so uh, mechanical equipment, shutting them down, sealing them up, opening up interior doors, uh, removing ceiling tiles as required. Those are, it's a lot of, it, it's a, on bigger buildings, it's a lot of work. So it really needs to be planned out ahead. Um, if you wait till the day of the test to figure out that you need to do it, usually it's, uh, it's too late. So understanding that, understanding where all the mechanical equipment, um, it's just a great exercise to go through that net pre-test plan so that you um, you figure out all that needs to be done, um, especially the mechanical equipment. You know, some half the time you're chasing down where a damper is located, where a louver is located. Do we need access to get to that louver? Um, there's always at least one piece of mechanical equipment that you got to discuss on that call that that uh, you got to kind of plan for ahead. So um, definitely an important part of that pretest plan. Um, and then you just go through the the timing of it, um, you know, we're going to get here at this time, we're going to finish the test at this time. Uh, the mechanical systems will be unsealed and back up in operation at this point in time. So sometimes that's important depending on the time of year. Um, 
uh, you know, when how quickly those systems can come back online and, and start conditioning the building again. So contact information, then we're going to dive in a little deeper to that test plan. So testing agency, owner's rep, HVAC's uh, representative, very key. They understand that if they installed the systems, they understand them. Uh, it's very critical that they are part of that process because they're the most knowledgeable with those systems. Electrician, uh, that goes to, you know, understanding your circuits to, to power the fans. Uh, you don't want to be stuck in the middle of the night with a blown breaker and you can't get to the electrical panel or understand where an independent circuit is. Electrician, typically you can, you can get your hands on some electrical plans with them early on. They may not necessarily need to be there the day of the test, but it's important that they're involved with the process. General contractor, absolutely key to the coordination of all of this. They're the really the leader and the, the, the glue that's that's bringing everybody together the day of the test. Um, the architect, uh, critical to that enclosure calculation. Um, and then the day of the test, I mean, there might be questions that you have that that's important for them to be there for it. And then obviously the commissioning agent plays a, a big role in it as well. Um, just answering questions on site, having input on how the testing is running. Um, so uh, definitely key to the the um, testing group that's that's part of the test yeah we do have a question is there okay. a demo video available to show a site test procedure or the steps that go into a site test procedure as far as uh running the meeting or uh showing examples of how the test preparation is performed i guess that's might be a follow-up question, question. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, a multi-layer question. I don't have the answer for you, but to Shang Hong Sun, who submitted this question, please feel free to add some addendums to that, and we'll be happy to answer it for you. Yeah, I'm going to get into some. I had do have some pictures of building prep here coming up, so maybe right. that'll answer the question. But if not, um, certainly can help them in any way later. I've got thousands of pictures of things, so I, um, hopefully this answers it. But if not, I can try to help them out the best I can. Perfect. So, yep. Was that it, or is there another one? Or that's okay. all. So, as I mentioned, um, this is the type of this is the time-consuming prep that I mentioned. So, ceiling tile. So, if you have lay-in ceilings, uh, the whole goal is 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 to get that equal pressure across all the boundaries of the building. You know that six-sided box. So. Uh, Lay-in ceilings can block certain portions of maybe the roof if it's on the top floor, or the exterior wall if it's along the perimeter. So we generally recommend, and the and a lot of the standards out there, it's usually one per 500 square feet or one per room, things like that. So um, sometimes that can be tough to do. You're going to have a ha have to have a ladder, and you go into each room. So it's it's very time consuming. It's easy to do, but it just takes a while. Um, propping interior doors is another one. So just an example of that up top, just making sure those doors are open. That allows communication. So we're we're basically pressurizing the building from one, two, maybe three locations uh, in the building, not like the HVAC system that has ductwork that goes everywhere. So the way we communicate air is through hallways, through doorways um, to get the entire building pressurized uniformly. Sometimes we need to use elevators shafts to if we have a really tall building and, and maybe we have a limited amount of staircases. Uh, generally, if the building's leakier, you know, we might have a trouble uh, pressurizing the top of the building. So the elevator shaft just promotes that um, uh, connection between the entire building or throughout the entire building. So not often. I mean, it, it's it's on the rare side that you need to do this, but on some buildings uh, you might have to. Uh, prepare to do this in advance, which takes a lot of coordination. Um, you need somebody that's that's competent with the elevator operation and, and uh, is able to, to set it up in a way that's um, not going to damage it and not going to, you know, have any uh, negative issues on the operation or safety during that test. HVAC ceiling. So here's, this is very, very important. Um, we want to isolate out the, the the mechanical systems from the test. We're really just trying to focus on the performance of the enclosure. So you can technically run the test with just the damper shut, but what we find is that um, 
dampers are, are, are very leaky. So the, it's really best practice to make sure your systems are shut down and sealed with plastic. So here's examples of, of that prep um, uh, that's done typically for the test. Same thing for uh, exhaust fans um, and ductwork that penetrates up through. Here's just an example of, of good prep versus bad prep. Um, really just want to isolate the mechanical system. We don't want to isolate the, the joint between the mechanical system and curb. There's actually a lot of air leakage there uh, that we want to make sure uh, that we want to make sure that the system's sealed properly. It's like any other penetration through. So uh, prep like on the lower right corner is not something that we want to that we want to see out there. Um, we're not accurately representing the air tightness of the building when, when it's prepped that way. And here's an example of why. So this is just an infrared scan of that interface between the ductwork and the curb. Tremendous amount of air leakage. Uh, and if you've got a lot of penetrations up through the roof, this could happen at every single one of them. So that's something to keep in mind too, if the building's failing, um, this might be a, a significant air leakage source that uh, can easily be addressed, um, but uh, it's just making sure that you find it. Um, here's an example, as I mentioned, you can run it without, sometimes you don't have access to seal the louver or the damper because it might be 50 feet in the air and you can't get a lift back there. Um, or it just, the way that they've, uh, sealed the ductwork to the exterior wall might limit your, you just don't have the access to do it. So in this case, uh, you know, confirming that those dampers are shut. That's a very, very important. Um, if you can't seal them up, the, the louver up, because uh, sometimes even if the control engineer thinks it's completely shut, you can find that it's not. You know, it's saying it's 100% shut, but it might be 50% open or it's completely open. I've had that happen a number of times. So if you can't seal them up, you gotta verify that the dampers are shut completely. Open air plenums are a big one. Uh, that's essentially an extension of the enclosure. It seems strange because the louver's on the outside, but when you seal it up for the whole building air test, that plenum, um, the, or the, the walls that separate the interior from the exterior, from the plenum space, are actually exterior walls and, and roof systems there, are ceiling systems. So that's just an example of sealing it in, inside the plenum at the actual damper. Um, here's an example of, uh, this is what happens when, when and why the testing agency shouldn't be doing the prep. Um, and it's the mechanical contractor and GC's responsibility to do it because you can damage equipment if it's not shut off properly. This was an open air plenum. They had not shut the units down. They were sealing it. Instead of sealing it at the interior line, where, as I showed in the previous picture where the dampers are, they were, show, they were sealing the louvers on the outside. Um, they got to the last louver, they sealed it up and the system, because it was still on it, it was, continuing to pull air and it created a suction and actually collapsed the, the louver in on itself. So it wasn't a good day for them. Uh, I'm glad I wasn't uh, responsible for it. <laughs> so something to keep in mind. This is why the coordination is so important. You got to have the right people there that understand the system so that you don't damage anything. Uh, blank off panels. Um, this goes into a little bit later. You know, that's kind of that gray area between enclosure and mechanical. Uh, that's something to keep in mind when, you know, in terms of an air, air leakage spot that might get overlooked. Uh, I've had a number of buildings where the blank off panels are not performing as an air barrier. Um, so just keep an eye on that uh, when you're doing building prep and how it's, how it's being handled. Technically, they're not supposed to be um, isolated off because they are supposed to perform as an air barrier in that case. Here's an example of as I mentioned before, dampers leak. So if you're worried about passing this test, uh, you do not want the dampers included because it could really, it could shift the performance substantially. In this case here, uh, we tested it with the HVAC dampers sealed and excluded, and then again with them included, and there was a 4,000 CFM difference. And this wasn't that big of a building either. So it's like 120,000 square feet of enclosure, which that's roughly a 40,000, well, maybe a yeah, it's 50,000 square foot building maybe. Um, so of, of actual floor area, not um, enclosure surface area. So not, not a big building, but um, you could see a, that they did really well here. It didn't, it didn't impact whether they were going to pass or fail, but if that was closer to the, the leakage criteria, you know, 4,000 CFM swing can get you, 
you know, past that or, or over the, the uh, allowable leakage rate. The test boundary, another another key part, and this this starts with the design, but it also can happen later on. You can figure out the boundary uh, uh, criteria that better fits the design of the building before you do the test. It's very important to establish this before you get out there and do the test. Um, so what's that six-sided box? How complicated is it? Um, we need to make sure we're drawing a line around this thing to really understand what's in and what's out, and that that surface area is included in the calculation. Um, so here's an example on the left is in a lot of the, you know, the government type projects, we're starting to see air barrier drawings. I push it on, on commercial projects that I'm on to have the design team included just sheets just to identify the air barrier boundary. It's very helpful for the contractor to understand that. It also makes you go through the process of understanding where that boundary is. Um, and some buildings can get a little bit complicated and not necessarily straightforward as to where that boundary is. So it, it just enforces that or, or promotes that uh, that analysis and, and make sure that you do have a continuous boundary. Um, on the right, that's just an ASHRAE uh, example. You know, you've got a vented attic space, unconditioned garage space, maybe semi-heated storage, what's in, what's out. Uh, define that from the start, you know, make sure that you've got a continuous air barrier boundary around what you would be considering the condition space. And if there's other spaces outside of that, they can be compartmentalized maybe separately within the, the, the main enclosure boundary, but maybe not within the air control boundary. Um, so it's very important to do that and establish that so that you can make sure the materials and systems, especially on interior conditions, you might need to make an interior wall and air barrier, which can be done with paint and drywall and things like that. But we need to understand that it needs to perform in that manner um, because there's, additional ceiling steps that need to happen to make sure that it does perform as an air barrier. Uh, here's an example. Uh, this happens kind of in that we're kind of in the residential, we're getting into commercial, multifamily, residential type construction, vented attics. Um, the vented attic, the, the air barrier is not the roof line. Uh, it, it's the ceiling at the second floor, just like a residential home. That could be very complicated to seal because you've got HVAC system equipment up there, or you've got plumbing running up through there. Um, in this particular case, they did not understand that, that concept. So every single penetration through the ceiling, every outlet, every uh, chase, duct, uh, sprinkler system, it all leaked and it, it failed horribly. And it's just because, because they didn't understand that six side, <clears throat> that ceiling boundary needed to be airtight and everything that penetrated through it needed to be airtight. So it's important to establish that boundary early on. If you're if you're catching something right before the test, you might still have a chance to go around and seal these things up and, and get a you know successful test. But it's understanding what that boundary is that's really really key. Here's another example of things that 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 commonly happen: um, perimeter rooms that aren't connected to the rest of the space, at the in and at the out. Um, they're kind of isolated uh, perimeter rooms. Um, Vestibule conditions, you know, where's the air barrier tying into? Are we tying it to the right location? Uh, in this particular case, <clears throat> I was I was convinced that that interior wall for those perimeter walls were airtight. Uh, I started up the test and it wasn't meeting performance requirements. So I'm like, ah, I should go and test and check those rooms. And sure enough, uh, what were supposed to be firewalls that were airtight were not at all, um, and those rooms were actually being pressurized to the rest, the equally to the rest of the building, and uh, it was a ten thousand cfm swing. So it was very important that I that I figured that out. Um, uh, and, and again, back to that test boundary. This in this case, you know, there was never a clear definition of where that boundary was, and I was sort of helping them figure that out on the fly. Another condition that happened was the vestibule, the main entrance vestibules. The outer line of doors that actually didn't latch. Uh, they, the intent was that you could run across the courtyard during a storm, you'd be able to get into the vestibule. The inner line was locked. Problem was that the air barrier only tied into the outer door. So when we would run the test, the doors would swing open. So what do we do? Um, that's a scenario that's really tough. I mean, I had to get everybody on board. I had to get the, the Army Corps there. I had to get the architect on the phone and we had to decide what we wanted to do to get through the testing. In this case, they blocked it shut um, and then they decided later what they wanted to do. So I had to get that owner buy-in 
Um, I had to get the designer to weigh in so that the, that I could run the test and there wouldn't be a question after as, for, as to what we did. This was clearly a, a boundary issue that, that wasn't not, was not going to get solved the day of the test. Here's an example of the building prep issues. And this is why multi-point, so just to rehash what I said earlier, why it's so important. Um, you're, you're humming along, you've got your, your, your test points are following the, the line, the linear um, path right in line. There's no deviation from it. All of a sudden we're stepping up. That's indicating something happened, something opened up, whether it was a door, whether it was building prep, um, in this case, it was building prep. It was, and of course, it was where we couldn't reach. It was where the plastic unsealed from the top of the of the damper. So, when you're watching this test, if you're going out there, you're concerned about passing the test. Have your head over, you know, try to peek in and look at the data for the testing agency. If you're seeing seeing something wrong um, with that correlation, uh, it's usually indicating something's changed, and, and it's important that they go back and fix that because uh, that could really mean a pass or fail for the test. And that's why it's important that the testing agency is really qualified and knows what they're doing. They're going to catch things like that, correct them, start the test over, make sure you're getting the actual uh, CFM leakage is accurate. Uh, pressure uniformity, I'll, I'll spin through this. This is, you know, the, as I mentioned before, the goal is to get the building equally pressurized throughout. So, you want to make sure that if you're test if you're at 75 pascals, you have 75 pascals against all the six across all the six sides of that enclosure. And we do that, we ver verify that through pressure tubing um, to make sure that we have that uniformity. In this example, this building was really leaky. And, and, and it's important to note that when you do have a leaky building, that's where what I in my experience, when when you have the most trouble with the uniformity is when you have a leaky building. Um, and you have to spread your fans out to make sure that you do get uniform pressurization. In this case, started out with the fans at the base of the building. Uh, we were a little bit off, so the rule of thumb or the rule that's in the in the uh, the thirty one fifty eight seven seven nine, you got to be within ten percent of the pressure throughout the building. We were a little bit outside of that. I moved the fan up to the top of the building, and then we were able to have a successful test. So that'll happen. Um, you know, you might experience it on a project where you're not getting uniformity. It's important that the testing agency is checking for uniformity as well. Um, so just something to keep an eye out. That, that's the intent for the test. That's that's how you're supposed to run it uh, and get a, you know, properly run test. When in stack, um, they impact the test stacks pressure. There's calculations in 3158, some of the other standards that give you limitations as to, you know, when you can run the test. Um, Usually it's a limitation of equipment. Back pressure on the fans can make them inaccurate. So it's important to understand, you know, that that should be part of that test plan. Are we going to be in a parameter or a, a, a time of year and based on the building height, are we going to be in a scenario where we shouldn't be running the test? Um, and then wind commonly, you know, we if you plan this test out three weeks in advance, you're not going to be able to predict whether there's going to be wind the day of the test. Um, so you can handle that on the day of the test. It's it's just how you're setting the equipment up. You can add more pressure ports at the bottom and, and average out the impact of the wind. And uh, so there's ways a, a, an experienced testing agency can handle wind. If it gets really, really bad, you might just have to postpone a test. But generally, if your wind speeds are under 20 miles an hour, um, you can get through it. It might take a little bit longer, but there's there's ways to get through it and get accurate results. So... Running the test, here's some examples. Um, I, I haven't mentioned sort of the leakage rates that are out there in the industry. We'll get into that now and I'll show you some real world, you know, some tests that I've done, show you some of the IR, some of the leakage points, trying to give you an idea of, you know, how good do you have to do to pass code level leakage? How, how good do you have to be to pass Army Corps level leakage? How, how good do you have to be to pass passive house level leakage. So hopefully these gives you give you a little bit of an idea of what to look, what what to expect. Um, so here's a building. So just a, a quick background. So IECC or, or uh, building code right now, it's uh, 0 0.4 CFM per square foot at 75 pascals, another common industry standard and, and also IGCC. So Army Corps and IGCC, um, they're requiring 0.25 CFM per so a little bit, so a little bit harder there. 
at 75 pascals. And then Fias is kind of the gold standard out there in terms of um, the highest level of, of air tightness is at 0.08 CFM per square foot at 75 Pascal. So just what I've done there is just put the, the total CFM you can leak next to it, just to kind of give you a, a, an idea um, uh, of how that changes based on the leakage criteria. But in this example here, this was a gym, very small building, um, about 10,000 square foot of just floor area, the closure area is about 40,000 square feet, but you can see, I mean, this thing was hemorrhaging air around the entire perimeter of the building and it still managed to pass code level air tightness. Code level air tightness is not very good. Um, it's, it's, it's code, so it's the minimum performance requirement. So don't get too worried about passing the test. I mean, there's a lot of uh, wiggle room in there. As you can see in the IR scans here, this thing you know, had some serious um, leakage uh, around the perimeter of the building. So, um, you know, we were at 16,000 CFM of leakage. Uh, you can see, you know, if you're going down to FIAS level, this would never pass. Probably wouldn't even, it, it, it wouldn't have passed the Army Corps level either, but code, it, it did. So just to give you a frame of, uh, of reference when you're, when you're testing a building for the first time. Uh, this was a larger uh, laboratory building, now we're really more isolated uh, leakage points that blank off panel overhead doors. They're, they're always a killer. Um, if you got an overhead door on your project, try to isolate that out of the test boundary, make an interior air barrier with interior walls or use more robust uh, weather seals, brush seals um, around the perimeter to, to enhance the air tightness. An off the shelf overhead coiling door is not gonna work that well. Um, and you're gonna get thousands of CFM leakage from it. Uh, HVAC, as I mentioned, HVAC ductwork sealing to the curb, a um, little random penetration detail here. So this, you know, this was more of a isolated spots. The general enclosure was pretty tight. The exterior walls, the roof, they were, uh, aside from the, the roof penetration, I mean, we didn't have a lot of leakage sites. Um, and we did really well, 0 0.15. But um, I mean, just look at the difference between what you're allowed to leak and this size building, 33. We came in at 33,000 CFM. I mean, if we were going to go for code, we, we could go all the way up to 88,000. That's a huge amount of air leakage. Um, you could have that overhead door wide open and probably passed. So just something to keep in mind, give you a frame of reference here. Here's a building, met Army Corps levels. Um, again, the leakage rate was really consolidated into one location. This was a, a dome uh, where, where most of the leakage occurred. Uh, but you can kind of get a, again, just trying to give you a frame of reference of a building of 150,000 square feet of enclosure. You can see just stepping down through those different uh, industry standards, uh, sort of what, what level you'd be looking for. But in this case, you know, it's just to go back to, yeah, they would have walked away and passed the test, but they still had a performance issue. Um, the leakage was consolidated to one location and that ended up being a, a catastrophic failure when the mechanical systems uh, malfunctioned, it went into depressurization mode, pulled a lot of cold air into this into the space, and there was a sprinkler system that ended up freezing and and uh, causing millions of dollars of damage. So, just because you pass the test doesn't necessarily mean you might not have a performance issue. So again, that qualitative analysis is really important as well. So keep that in mind. As a building renovation, left was the pre-test. Right was the the right image was the the post test so um, implemented you know in, replaced all the windows did some sealing of the facade um, and had a tremendous amount of improvement um, but we still had leakage points that I found at canopy conditions soffit penetration conditions again the mechanical curves so did really well but I mean we're, we came in at point two we still had you know significant leakage sites so just again just kind of giving you that that story um just because when you're trying to pass this test it doesn't necessarily mean you have everything sealed up there's a, there's a, there's a lot of holes that you can have not to promote uh <laughs> having holes but uh there there is a, a, a some leeway there and you can still pass the test but um we always as i mentioned always re recommend that you, if we do find something with an infrared scanner smoke that you go back evaluate the risk there and 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 try to repair everything, um, even though you've passed, passed the quantitative test. Um, so here's just another visualization. Sometimes you can 
You can have a building that has a bunch of holes everywhere. That'd be more of a distributed amount of air leakage. Or sometimes you get most of the building airtight, but it's isolated to one spot. Sometimes you have that on a, a smaller, um, we'll say like a firehouse or, or fire department where <clears throat> the building's office space, but then you've got this work bay. They get the air barrier right, except, except for the overhead doors. And all of a sudden you got this really focused air leakage in one spot. So both can happen. The isolated one is actually more dangerous depending on where that uh, that dome example you might have you don't want all this air coming through in, in a sensitive location because it might cause some type of failure uh here's just you know another visualization through the different levels of air tightness that are out there in the industry point four on the left you know we've got a lot of holes distributed around um, 0 0.2 4, 2, 5, we're starting to tighten them up you know not as easy to pass but as long as you got an eye on it, you know, you're thinking about air tightness, somebody's, you know, looking at a co the continuous boundary, um, you know, you, you've got good section details, you can do pretty well, still have some, still have some mishaps in there, but still pass. Um, and then of 0.08 at passive house level or 0.1, it's a common uh, performance requirement out there. You got to have it dialed in. Uh, you really need to have every detail buckled, you know, buckled up and, and really honed in and designed and installed properly to get to get through that test. So what do we do? We don't want to fail. What do we do? Let's just walk through a quick you know, checklist or cheat, cheat sheet here. First and foremost, as I've mentioned, you want to have an experienced testing uh, agency out there doing it. They can, you know, that building prep can really impact how that test performs you don't want to fail because a door blew open so you need you need to have somebody that understands their equipment understands the test uh knows what to look for because the the test specimen is big it's the building so uh you're not gonna be able to have eyes on 100 percent of that throughout the test so you all you have is your gauges and your your sensors to to figure out what's going on um uh when when you're actually running the test um, do you have ancillary space? We talked about this, open air plenums, work bays, vented crawl spaces. You don't want those in the test. They have intentional openings, openings in them or they're not designed to be airtight. Um, we've got to isolate them out. And then when we isolate them out, we've got to make sure that interior separation is airtight. Um, parking levels, elevator penetrations, those are the big, the big holes are where you're going to get in trouble on this. So you got to make sure we've buttoned up those big holes. Um, because we might have a problem. Um, double check the test boundary. Just because the designer thinks it's in a certain spot, you may have more experience with that building type. Check it, double check it. Make sure it makes sense. Make sure it's continuous. Uh, make sure everybody uh, understands it and agrees to it. Um, you could have a big, a big hole somewhere that really determines whether you're going to pass or fail. Um, as, and then, I, as I mentioned, yeah, the big holes. That's what's going to that's what's going to move the needle, especially in a 0.4 test or 0.25 test. You know, you, you don't want that big transition or an overhead door or something like that. It's really contributing, you know, hundreds of, or even thousands of CFM that really move that needle and, and, and you might not pass because of it. Um, so here's just, you know, an exercise below. I Here I've got the major interfaces circled um, in the plan view. I've got the big circle around um that's a work bay so in this case they actually isolated and they bring, brought the air barrier in to exclude it from the test so that was really good we were able to test they actually had the, the overhead door open for the test and the interior wall is the air barrier so we've ruled out that leaky overhead door uh what do we do if we're failing as i mentioned check don't be satisfied when they say it's failing they got to check all the test prep They've got to run around, they got to walk the entire building, make sure the doors are latched, make sure that windows are latched. All that stuff has to be perfect and, and intact and, to, and confirmed to make sure that that's not contributing to the leakage that might be resulting in a test. If that's all been checked, now you got to check for door adjustment. Um, sometimes doors aren't latching tightly against the weather seals. You, want, you might be able to adjust those on site, missing weather seals. Overhead coiling doors might be missing seals. Um, these are all things that I've seen touched up on site. They had the materials there. They were able to remediate it, and, and uh, we had a successful test. Missing joints. Um, there's there those those things. You're at, you're you're at the end of the project. It might be something that just got missed. So um, 
you know, make sure you don't have a big hole somewhere that you could, you know, easily seal up and, and uh, retest. So um, a lot of these things can contribute a lot. Missing thresholds. I've, I've done tests before and after with the threshold taped off and then opened up, gotten over 300 CFM at one door. So imagine if you got 15 doors. I mean, that's, that's a significant amount. As I mentioned, coiling doors, same thing. I mean, thousands of CFM. Um, some of the bigger doors, they just can't seal. They, they, they bend in the middle because they're so big. So there's only something, only a limited amount that you can do to make sure that you're passing. Uh, and then lastly, infrared camera smoke traces, they're your best friends when things aren't passing. That's the, that's the equipment that you're gonna use to figure out what the heck is going on. If the testing agency doesn't have it, um, really question that. Uh, they, they should always have that equipment with them um, otherwise you're going to need somebody else on site that's going to be operating that because that's your only method of really finding out what's going on. If, if things are, are hidden or not, not, not apparent. Um, so if you, if you start getting into this test and you find the testing agency's not doing that and not, they're not being contracted to do that portion, you know, don't be afraid to bring that along and, and for your own sake to try to figure out, you know, what's going on and how you can help the, the, the test actually pass. So lastly, just wanted to, I know we're running short on time here. I just wanted to, or past time, hopefully everybody's still stuck around. Uh, just wanted to let you know about the whole building air tightness uh, program that I mentioned in the beginning. So the, the blower door training is actually a five-day course. Uh, right now, it's, we're offering it in Seattle. Um, it uh, great course. Um, we're hoping that we're getting a lot of good feedback and, and uh, also needing to open up locations in other portions of the country. So we've got the East Coast locations uh, started up here. Hopefully pretty soon we'll be able to host the training out of those locations as well. And then maybe somewhere in the Midwest and, and, and South as well. So those are all things uh, in the near future that we hope to get established. The other thing that we're really proud of is um, short, very shortly we'll be launching the blower door certification. So once you go through the training, or maybe you're an experienced tester already, you can go take a test or go through the training, get your certification, um, and then you know down the road when either code or Army Corps or um, design team decides to specify a certified blower door technician, you're going to have that certification that shows that you know what you're doing. So, both very very cool new things that we've we've rolled out. I'm very proud of. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, so the, the breakdown of that training course, it's a two uh, conceptual learnings. So we do a lot of building science, um, how to run the test. A lot of the, you know, we've got a training manual that we go through during the course. And then there's two days of hands-on training. We actually have mock-ups built. We're using the equipment. We're going through some te different test simulations. So you get comfortable uh, performing the test. And then actually on the last day, we do a full or a whole building air test to uh, to get you up to speed and able to actually perform a test on a commercial building. So very comprehensive course. Uh, you come out, I wish I had it when I started. I had to learn the hard way <laughs> overnight, staying there for hours on end, trying to figure out what was going on. So is there a question? Am I running out of time? <laughs> Or both. We're running out of time, but I do have a few questions. So hopefully we can we can blow through these pretty quick and let these people get back to their regular time. Yeah, I'm, I'm basically done. I mean, th this is the last slide. The, just wanted to show uh, the upcoming courses. If you wanted to sign up, just mm -hmm. go to the PBA website. Um, those are the ones available now. Uh, if they get filled up, as I mentioned, these other locations, we'll, we'll start opening up more locations well. So the new locations um, we're hoping to get is at Penn State University in Syracuse. So that's basically it. That's amazing. So um, first of all, everybody, please mark down what you just saw on that screen. And if you have any further questions after this, you can always reach out to MetalCon and we will happily get the, the questions over to ABAA and Adam, or if you'd prefer. Um, Adam, I think, were you open to receiving questions? Yeah. People have it. Awesome. Perfect. So a few of the questions we have here that are open are, um, it's going to be a very tough question to answer, but do you have an average cost um, or an example of the cost of a building uh, leakage, air leakage testing um, system? 
Oh, to the equipment or the actual test? The actual test. Like how much does it actually cost to get done? Um, so it depends on, there's two big factors, um, the building size and then the leakage rate. So both those variables are going to impact how much equipment you're going to need. So the amount of equipment, if, if say you're doing a build, uh, multi-family, 500,000 square foot multi-family at point four, you're going to need like 20 fans to do it. That's going to take a lot of people, a lot of equipment. If you're doing that same building at point one, you might only need a 10% 10, 10 of that equipment or, or significantly less. All of a sudden, the cost of that test goes down significantly. So, um, I mean, you're, you're looking at smaller buildings at lower leakage rates. You're looking, you know, in the in the neighborhood of, you know, two to 5,000, you go up to these bigger buildings. I mean, you can, I've done tests where you're mobilizing 20 people to do them. I mean, they're, you know, massive, massive buildings with a significant amount of equipment. I mean, you could be talking 30 or $40,000 or more. Um, but I think that the, 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 the sweet spot, you know, where the majority of buildings are, it's going to be in that five to 10,000 range, I think is a safe bet. Right. But as we, as I said, once, as we tighten up that leakage rate and the industry understands the test more, that's going to come down and there's going to mm -hmm. be more testing agencies, more local. I mean, I've, I spent a lot of time flying across the country doing the test because there's not enough testing agencies to be able to do it. So a lot of, you know, as this becomes adopted, we get more testing agencies doing it. The leakage rate gets lowered because we're finding we're meeting that performance criteria. All those costs are going to come down. So, Awesome. So another question is, if exterior louvers can be excluded from the test, is the test result comprehensive? So it goes back to what you're looking for from the test. It, the If you want an operational test, which there's um, procedures in 3158 that describe that, you can certainly run the test again with the louvers unmasked. Um, it, it goes to what your design of that mechanical system, if, if the intent for that building is to at some point operate with the damper shut, um, then, it, then that data is going to be very important. Um, so it all depends on what you're looking for. But the key that we want to do is isolate those two main those two systems from each other. We want we want to understand what the air barrier boundary is doing, and then if we if we're curious about what the mechanical system is doing in terms of air tightness, we're going to want to see that value separated um, or isolated so that we understand the difference between the two. If you conflate the two. You don't really know what's contributing to it, and we know dampers leak, so we don't want air leakage from the dampers contributing to the to the air barrier. So, short answer is, it, yeah, I've done a lot of testing that way, where you do both uh, architectural only and operational. Um, in some cases, it's you know the data might not be as valuable as others, but it is comprehensive in terms of understanding the enclosure integrity and continuity when you isolate them out. Right. Um, another question is, when do you anticipate testing will be required? We know so many states have implemented whole building air testing as a requirement, but other states have not. Is it safe to assume that it will become a true requirement once it is incorporated into some kind of building code or energy code? Can you speak to where these testing requirements are in the process of being adopted by the ICC? And, is the, and in which IBC we can expect to see this become an absolute requirement? It's going to be uh, a stepped process, but I believe 2021 code year, um, or sorry, 2022, 2021 20, or 22, I can't remember off the top of my head. It's introduced up to a certain building size. Um, so it's going to un unroll, un be unrolled in increments. Okay. Um, so if your if your state is going to adopt the most recent code, you'll start seeing it immediately, um, up to a certain building size, and then after that, it's going to be in in increments, um, and then jurisdictionally. So 
I know a lot of cities are starting to require it, like Washington, D.C., New York City, um, the state of Washington requires it. Um, there's there's a lot of uh, s jurisdictions within states that are adopting it um, holistically, but but uh, as far as in the IBC, we're going to have to wait until your state <laughs> adopts the latest code cycle. So um, I wish it was sooner, but it's going to it's going to be a little bit before okay. it's across the country. Yeah, that makes sense. For a building ceiling prep to be performed by the GC, do you make recommendations on what type of tape or materials that should be used that will hold up to the various pressures? Some GCs think duct tape will be enough, but it can pop off during testing. Do you have recommendations? Yeah. Um, well, the, the tape I really loved was discontinued, um, but I've been using a 3M high high adhesion tap, uh, like their highest adhesion level duct tape. Um, but there's others, uh, I've seen tapes similar to, I'm trying to think of the proprietary you know, well, best The best way to describe it is the vapor barrier tape that's common, commonly used for like a stego vapor barrier tape. I've seen that used. Uh, it's usually just, you go to Lowe's or you go to your local hardware store and you, and you, and you get some that you, that, that are offered there and just test it on the surfaces that you have. Um, I found that the 3M tape works really well, but there's others out there. Um, it's just kind of trial and error. Okay. We do have another question, which is, is a person allowed in the testing area while the testing is being performed? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you want to limit as many people as you can the day of the test only because you if you if, if you had 50 people there and they all knew that they were just there to watch a test and they'd sit still and watch it then it'd be completely fine the issue is when you get more people on site they tend to migrate in and out of the building and you don't know it <laughs> so um it's just about if people understand what's going on, I, I've done tests with a lot of people in the building. They knew that they couldn't go outside. And if they did, they just had to radio to us. So that's really the, the limitation is it, it's the understanding of the, the, the folks on site um, and, and knowing that they can't exit the building in the middle of the test or step on equipment and things like that. So best best rule is to have the limit the amount of people, but you can do it. With, with people in the building. Fantastic. And that is all the questions that we had for you today. So without cool. further ado, I will say thank you so much to all of our attendees for joining us. Everybody who's watching live or watching in the future, please make note of the slide on the screen right now. If you have any further questions regarding air barrier testing, or if you'd like to contact Adam regarding air barrier testing or ABAA, please make note of the contact information on the screen right now. Again, huge thank you to everyone who joined us live for today's session, and a huge thank you to everyone watching in the future on YouTube. Um, most importantly, thank you to ABAA for being our co-presenters, and a huge thank you to Adam for taking the time out of your day to be here with us and present with all of your extensive knowledge on air barrier testing. Thank you, thank everybody. You. <laughs> we look forward to seeing you at our next MiddleCon Live. See you soon.